with kind of speculation than actually dealing with these materials themselves. Sometimes these are designers. For example, this piece is by an artist whose name is Revital Cohen, called Life Support, and she's coming out of the Royal College of Art in London and had designed this incredibly interesting project where um, she's trying to think about using transgenic animals in a way that could act as a, as a sort of extension for humans with their own and, and our bodies. You know, we've been working a lot, quite a bit, to do things such as uh, develop organs in other animals and stuff like that. This is, this is Revital taking this project, this idea of a project, the speculation of a project, one step further. So for example, in this piece, she has a kind of genetically altered sheep that has been grown with the, with the genetics of a dialysis person, the person who has renal failure, for example. And they are completely compatible because of this. They've had an exchange of their own DNA. And as a result, this guy can go to sleep at night hooked up to this little lamb who will actually regenerate his blood by, by filtering his blood through her uh, kidneys. And then she can go around the yard in the daytime and then come back at night and be his filtration system. It's kind of bizarre. It's like a very bizarre idea, right? And it touches on a lot of really creepy ethical questions. But we're very close to this. I mean, it's the speculation, but we're very close. Here's another piece by her called, uh, from the same series of life support, which works with uh, greyhounds. Now, you know that greyhounds get offed after their five years of service doing the, you know, running around the track, right? And, the, and it's really a tragic number of greyhounds that get killed every year. This is a way to rehabilitate the greyhound and to help people with pulmonary diseases. So for example, the greyhound gets to live with this person so, they're not, so they don't have any kind of anxiety separation there with that person. And as they run on their tra treadmill chasing the rabbit, which is how they're trained around the track, they're fitted with a harness that will actually expand and contract as they're breathing, and that will help push air into the lungs of the pulmonary patient. So they're completely intricately involved. So Revital got into some kind of, a lot of ethical debates around these, these projects because they are sort of really questionable. But as I said, we're super close to this as it is. Here's another project that more in the sculptural realm by an artist, P Patricia Piccinini, who's an Australian artist. <clears throat> and this is an older piece but this is dealing with transgenics again. In this piece, she's got this kind of beautiful mother figure, right, with her little babies, but they're really creepy. There's something very human about this creature, but it's kind of not, right? There's some in-between space. And what, what Pacini is interested in is trying to look at, okay, we're developing these creatures, we're developing transgenic creatures, taking DNA from one uh, species, putting it into another one, and we need to figure out the kind of care that we're going to give to these species. This is an older piece, right? It's 2002, 2003. The idea of transgenics has shifted very much in this past 12 to, to 13 years. So, you know, we've come a long way in terms of our understanding of it. When she made it, people didn't even understand what that meant. Another artist who actually graduated from this program, um, who was just here this afternoon, Pinar Yoldas, who's really amazing has been working with um, t dealing, thinking about the plastic soup that, is our, that makes up our oceans at this point in time. So this is a piece called An Ecosystem of Excess that she created recently. And um, it's a collection of various taxa uh, from a new ecosystem that emerges in our plastic sea. That's a quote from her. So this, this is the link to the Vimeo. I really encourage people to go and look at this video. It's super beautiful. Um, and the sculptures she has developed are thinking through how can we, how, what, if, what if our animal, our, our ocean and um, reptilian fish, ocean uh, living creatures develop their organs to a point where they can adapt and begin to live off of the plastic in the seas? What, what will they look like? What will, that, what will we all become? We're all made up of plastic at this point anyway. We've all got plastic in us. But, it's, but you know, this is our future. Plastic is our future. So she's really questioning this and trying to figure out how will these, these changes occur. I really love her work. She's great. Um, 
Here's another artist who documents science practices. So she's not actually changing, uh, working with living materials in this series per se, but I think this kind of work is also really important. It's an, a photographer whose name is Catherine Chalmers. She's been photographing different genetically engineered mice. And these portraits are not like the typical ones you see on the pamphlets from the research facilities that, that grow these models, that develop the models for research. On those pamphlets, you see these kind of happy mice, like Dan or rats, that are sort of like, hi, I'm your model. But you don't really see this, a blind, sterile mouse, or this, the one developed for obesity, right? Or this one, which is a rhino, the, the species is rhino, but it's, de dealt, it's being developed for immune problems. That's why it has no hair. Or this one, which is a Down syndrome mouse. So that means that they're, they're, they have human DNA inserted into them, and every generation that's bred is going to still have <coughs> Down syndrome. <clears throat> Another um, project that deals with synthetic biology and synthetic aesthetics uh, is, which is a really important new area that we're getting into, is this area of synthetic biology, is um, this project that was done a few years ago by um, Daisy Alexand da Alexandra Daisy uh, Ginsburg and James King, along with a team from, um, from Cambridge for the iGEM competition. Has anybody here heard of the iGEM competition? Uh, it's out of MIT, and wait, I have to, I have to find the note as to what it stands for because I always forget the name for some reason. It's the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition. Now synthetic biology is an interesting new area which is really kind of the forefront of where we're headed uh, with, with a lot of our sciences. It's a combination of engineering and biology. This is a way of building new kind of parts that we can put together to build living creatures, right? So they have these DNA uh, bio bricks, they call them. And these particular uh, scientists working together in tandem with these designers, Ginsburg and King are designers, developed a project where they could insert DNA into um, E. coli that then you could consume in some way. And it could be an indicator for certain kinds of toxins that you might come across. So if you're drinking polluted water or something like that, maybe your poop will turn green. You know, or if you eat some kind of uh, salmonella meat, maybe you'll have a purple poop, whatever. She's really, she's really looking into these, they're, they're, they're speculating and looking into a way that we can have more predictive sort of uh, systems built into our own bodies. And they actually won first prize at the iGEM competition this year. She's also, Daisy Ginsburg has also put out a book called Synthetic Biology, Synthetic Aesthetics, which I highly recommend and, and encourage you all to look at. So this is really the crux of the matter is this work coming up is what I'm also interested in, this idea of manipulating life and the art that comes from that manipulation. Now this is stolen completely from or Orin Katz from Symbiotica. Um, this, this is a slide of Vacanti and J, uh, J, Charles and, and Jay Vacanti's uh, mouse from 1997, so it's almost 20 years ago. How many of you have seen this slide? How many of you find it horrifying? Okay, yeah, okay. So Oren Katz has presented this in many lectures that I've seen him give. And what's interesting is he's tracked this over many years. When, people, when, this, slide, when this image first came into the media, it was really horrific for people. People were really freaked out by it. Now we're kind of like, yeah, seen it. We know what this is about, you know. It was, it was a way that these scientists were trying to point to new synthetic uh, organs that could be grown. It could be grown in animals, that could be grown for organ transplant, et cetera. Um, now we find it kind of, a, there's kind of a normativity about it. At that point in time, when it came out in 1997, it was really kind of scary as to what this image meant and what, what direction we were going in. Another earlier work is by an artist, Eduardo Cac, who probably many of you have heard of, um, a really seminal, pioneering bio artist. And this is an early piece of his called Alba, which was about a green glowing bunny, right? This is the fluorescent bunny 
that, that CAC was very interested in trying to um, develop and then take home with him. Now the project was developed in France and in a laboratory there. This is, this is uh, fluorescence that comes from jellyfish that is infused actually in many creatures, but this, in this case it was developed for, in the bunny. CAC was really interested at this point in time, again, going back to 2000, so this is 15 years ago, in trying to change the perception people had about transgenics. by taking the GFP gene from jellyfish, putting it into the bunny rabbit, making it glow, right? So he talked about, and this is a quote from him, today our ability to generate life through the, through the direct method of gen genetic engineering prompts a reevaluation of the cultural objectification and the personal subjectification of animals. And in so doing, it renews our investigation of the limits and potentials of what we call humanity. I do not believe that genetic engineering eliminates the mystery of what life is. To the contrary, it reawakens in us a sense of wonder towards the living. So I love this sense of his, of trying to really understand what the science means for us culturally. And he did this really interesting thing, and here he is with the bunny, where he plastered that image of the green bunny all around the streets of Paris in a way to sort of make people say, like, what is this? You know, and to start this dialogue, what is transgenics? What does it mean to us culturally? And this is a really important project, I think, for this very reason. Now, he wasn't able to take the bunny home. It's very hard to get animals out of the labs, and I, I'll talk about that more in, with one of my projects. And at the same time, it's also even harder to get a bunny to go from France to the US if it's not being used for, for scientific research. So it didn't, it didn't happen the way he had hoped. And also, a bunny really wouldn't look like that if it was GFP. It might, here are some animals and some other uh, things that we actually know, like glow, a glowfish. I am going to walk away from the mic. That. that glowfish has been on the market in pet stores, right? So you can go buy one right now. So it's, again, not that scary at this point in time. In fact, biotechnology has been around for a very long time. Think of beer, the production of beer, right? From the Egyptians to the Germans to us, et cetera. This has been going on forever. The thing that started to change towards the beginning, middle, early middle of last century is this kind of industrialization of the process. So industrial fermentation practices started to come on board. And of course, we've also had this idea of natural selection, species selection that has been happening for eons. Think about dog breeders, think about horse breeders. I'm, I'm trying to speed through some things because I want to get to some, uh, some of the final works. One of the earliest installations of a living, of living work in a gallery that, I, that we can cite is um, Edward Steichen's uh, Delphiniums that was shown at the Museum of Modern Art. Now this is, this is a piece that went alongside of his photographs. He was a very famous American photographer, right? But he was also a plant breeder. He was really, really into breeding plants. And he would not open the show until he had the perfect set of delphiniums to put into the show. So this is one of the first shows that had living material in a gallery, museum kind of setting, that had um, plants in it in 1936. Another artist who's been dealing with manipulating life is Marta de Menes, who's a Portuguese artist. She did this really interesting project, again, around 2000, the same time as Alba Bunny, where she actually added another um, dot on the wing of this butterfly. So you can see the wing on the, on the right is untouched, sort of na nature, as you would find it. And the one on the left, she's manipulated and added these other dots to it, a kind of new nature. Um, Oh, thank you. Press that. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So, thanks so much, Garrett. So, um, okay. So this is the new nature that she's talking about. She did this by inserting a needle, hot needle, into the cocoon. Apparently, there are no uh, nerve endings in the wings of these butterflies, so they did not feel any pain around this. But she was very interested in this kind of alteration 
of nature and, and what this might mean if we look at it. It's not that nature isn't beautiful in and of itself, but the fact that we can begin to create alter alterations to it is what was fascinating her. This is a Belgium artist, uh, Cohen van Melchen, who's been doing this ridiculously great project called the Cosmopolitan Chicken Project, where he's crossbreeding chicken species to go backwards to the great, you know, original chicken, the Asian, Asian chicken fowl, right? Jung the Asian jungle fowl, sorry. This is supposedly the ancestor of all chickens. So it's like a reverse engineering project where he's trying to really, you know, keep going back and back and back. And basically these chickens are his collaborators. This is, this is his installation. The installation is the chickens. You see the results of his work in the gallery itself. Brandon Ballingy is an artist I've, we've been d working with collaboratively uh, through the Sanctuary for Independent Media, a nonprofit organization that I work with, and he's an incredible biologist and artist dealing with ecological issues and environmental issues. He's very interested in this part of this stained toad. What this is is showing us toxins in the environment. The fact that this toad has a few too many legs shows us something is going on out there. And the way that Brandon presents these is by staining both the cartilage and the bone structure of these animals. He collects them in the field and then he takes them back and does this. It's a process that can take up, take up to a few months. When these are presented, they can be presented quite large, maybe not this big, but you know, he actually limits himself to the size of a four-year-old because he thinks that that develops a certain kind of empathy or he can develop them, he can show them in a petri dish where you see that the toad he's working with is actually this big. It's about half an inch in, so, in size. So it's a really great way of dealing with scale, dealing with reality, and developing empathy for these creatures that also begins to make us have an understanding of these as determinators and indicators of our environmental problems, our environmental pro de toxins. Here he is in the field collecting, and he, tra he, tra he also trains people to become citizen scientists so you too can learn how to look for these indicators. Heath Bunting is a British artist who's really interested in kind of throwing a monkey wrench into the um, giants like Monsanto in the world, and he wanted to develop this super weed project where um, people could shoot off this rocket and it would be filled with weeds, super weeds that would ultimately genetic, some of them were genetically modified too. This is to get in there and completely fuck with their system of genetically modified crops. So it's an anti-GMO uh, project that he did in Europe, um, which if they, if it depended on how things were going, the Europeans are much more interested in eradicating GMO than we are in the States. We don't even have like proper labeling at this point. This is a project by, by the Critical Art Ensemble, which I think is one of the groups that's the most important in this entire field in this country in terms of developing kind of critical awareness of where we're going with things. And this is a project called Free Range Grain that they had tried to show at the Museum of, um, the Mass Mocha Museum of Contemporary Art in, in Western Massachusetts, um, and right around the time when Steve Kurtz was arrested with a very tragic story of them finding petri dishes that he was developing for this show in his laboratory. I mean, in his house, sorry. Um, uh, the reason that the cops were in his house was because his wife had had a heart attack and he called them to come, 911, to come in. When they found the, the sort of markings of this, they called him a terrorist and they took all of his materials away. And actually, he went through years and years and years defending himself, trying to get out from under this, which he finally did. But this was a project that was very innocuous, and it was about testing so-called organic foods that you could bring to them in the laboratory, I mean, in the, in the ex exhibition. So it was a kind of performative exhibition where you could bring them an apple that was organic and say, is this really organic? And they would test it to see if there were, there were any GMOs in there, right? So it was really an incredible project, which didn't get to be shown at Mass Mocha because of this tragedy of Steve and his um, whole trial. It's a longer story, so I, I don't have time to get into it, but Mary's gonna tell you all about it later on. Um, this is publication by Critical Art Ensemble, um, Contestational Biology. And Contestational Biology actually 
asks, you know, what, why should people be doing public experiments? What is kind of fuzzy biological sabotage? Why should we be thinking about doing pranks? What is selective engineering? What is disrupting new product development, tactical media, and stuff like that? This publication you can download for free online. I highly encourage you to go look at the Critical Art Ensemble's website. All of their writings are, for, are available, and you can just download them and, and all their books and read them. They're like these little gems of pamphlets, so I highly encourage you to look at them. Another, another amazing artist uh, who's been inspiring to me is, is Paul Venus, who has been trying to, uh, in this project, kind of debunk the idea of um, DNA fingerprints. DNA fingerprints, you know, are likened to our fingerprints that we have as, as identities for ourselves. But in fact, these can be completely manipulated. And he's questioning the science behind it and the kind of legitimacy of the legal system using this as a foolproof for putting people away. He, he's actually gone so far as to be able to um, copy the DNA fingerprint that was produced for O.J. Simpson by, with his own genes. So it's, a, it's a, 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 using different kinds of enzymes and things like that, you can manipulate the outcomes of these PCR analysis. And he's also developed things like this project on the right, which is, um, you know, he's designed what the, what the, the uh, PCR can actually look like in the end. So here it is, a, a copyright. He's done a skull and other things. But they're really quite amazing. Um, Heather, Heather Dewey Hagborg is another artist who's dealing with DNA and surveillance and the legal system per se. Um, she's actually um, picking up people's kind of stray DNA, like when you're on the street and you throw your gum out, or you put your cigarette on the sidewalk, or you leave a cup of coffee somewhere, right? She's picking these things up and doing a kind of analysis of that DNA to the point where she can get this kind of uh, analysis from what she found in her in in, in the found cigarette butt in the found um, uh, you know gum. This is this is really dangerous, and this is something actually that the police forces are beginning to look into. And it's a question as to whether it's legal or not. It's not it's legal in some states, and it's not legal in others. So um, she's trying to push the boundaries of what is this kind of biological surveillance that's going on right now, and how far will it go, and where do we stand as citizens? What are our rights? She's developed it to a point where she <coughs> wants to, um, she's developed another project called De Invisible, where she's trying to encourage people to uh, eradicate their DNA trace. So you can either do erase or replace, right? Erase, erases the DNA around your wine glass you just had at the bar. Replace has a mixture of like 50 different people's DNA that you can spray onto it to totally confuse things. So she's selling this now. Again, go to this website, Biogen Futures. Um, she's selling this product now, which is real, and it really works. <clears throat> My probably biggest influences and, and people who I think also have shape the field the most are this group called Tissue Culture and Art, which are a team of Unet Zur and Oren Katz. They're probably the, some of the best tissue culture experts in the entire, uh, well, in, in the entire art scene. But, but even, even with scientists, their, their techniques are admired. An early piece of theirs was a project called Semi-Living Worry Dolls. They developed this theory around semi-living. When we're working with cells in the laboratory, um, they're not really, they can't leave the laboratory or they'll be tainted, but they also are completely alive. To finish an experiment, you can, you know, put bleach into the, uh, into the cells, pour them into something with bleach. You can touch them and they'll, have, they'll get bacteria or fungus that will kill them. But they are living creatures. And so they, they developed this theory around trying to think through what, what does it mean to be a, a model used in a laboratory? What is this idea of semi-living? And they, this project uses um, the idea of worry dolls, those kind of Ecuadorian dolls that you had as a kid. You'd put them under your pillow, you'd tell them your worries, right? Anybody heard about this? They're really great. This, this one over here is made out of tissue culture. So they took 
samplings from an animal and developed it over a kind of a polymer ske skeleton. And here it is living in one of the many kind of sculptural adapted uh, spaces that they have in an exhibition. People were allowed to whisper to the semi-living worry dolls their worries. So they have a whole archive of what these worries are that people have about genetics and biotechnology. Again, 2000, so things were very different at that point in time. And here's probably one of their most famous projects, which is called Victimless Leather, which plays with this idea of trying to make a leather coat without using an animal product, right? That would be a dream of ours. Like, like, you know, in vitro meat, meat that we make in the laboratory. They also did a project around that. So again, they made this little polymer coat, and they've got a cell structure, living tissue over it. Um, it but this is how it show, is shown in a gallery. This is how it was shown at, at Museum of Modern Art in New York, for example. It has this whole system and infrastructure that it has to have to support it, to support this life. This little thing won't live outside of this system. So it's kind of an impossible dream to make this victimless leather. So part of the project talks about that. Part of the project also talks about the food that is fed, the medium, they call it the medium, that is fed to the cells to keep the cells alive, actually comes from bovine serum. It's from calf blood. So calves are sacrificed to make this bovine serum. So that, again, there is an irony. There is no kind of you know, animalless coat that can be made in this environment. Um, but their project also did a really interesting thing, which is that when it was shown, oops, sorry, when it was shown at the Museum of Modern Art, it developed a kind of fungus in the coat and it started to grow this really weird extension to it. And the curator there was put into a very strange situation where she had to decide what to do with it. And basically she had to kill it. She had to pull the plug. And she had never had to kill an artwork before. So it's a very weird, kind of creepy situation for curators to now find themselves dealing with living materials in their, in their galleries, in their museums, and how to handle them. Because we have carbon life. We have life and we have death. So what does that mean? We have to engage with it. And I think that's what I find really interesting and compelling about this work. I'm going to skip over this project just to say that they developed a kind of uh, tried to develop an ear that was going to grow for Stellark, another performance artist in, in uh, Australia. He ended up actually using a scaffolding under his arm here, and that's what it finally ended up being, not the project that the tissue culture and art had grown. But doesn't this look an awful lot like that ear on that mouse, the Vacanti mouse that we saw? Um, so Stellark is a really great artist as well, so look at his work. Okay, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, works that I have done as well. And I'm going to start with an older project of mine that dealt with transgenic rats. Okay? It's not like I'm into rats or anything. In fact, I was completely freaked out by rats when I first started this project. Um, but I was interested in trying to look at what, who, was, who was being researched uh, on, who was, who was like the subject, the model, that the research for diseases that I have is developed with, sorry, I'm not being very articulate there, but I have Crohn's disease, for example, and uh, who, you know, like what are the rat or mice models that are developed to make, make a medicine that I might take? So it's kind of a reverse look, going backwards at that. Um, and I found these transgenic rats, which are actually the first transgenic rats that were created, um, that were created for rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera. And I thought, this is, this is great. I really want to start working with these animals and treating them with alternative medicines like I treat myself. I don't really engage with the normal medical practice that much, traditional medical practice that much. So I built them this housing. At the, and again, it was at the Museum of um, Mass Mocha, uh, Contemporary Art in Western Mass, as part of an exhibition called Becoming Animal. My piece was called Embracing Animal. And I built them this very large housing situation, kind of like a penthouse for rats. Now, I was very interested in and inspired by a theorist whose name is Donna Haraway. And she was one of the people who got me thinking about why I might want to engage with this work at all. And she said, and I'll read this, and you can read along with me. I hate this kind of stuff, but here we go. Onco Mouse TM 
trademark, is my sibling, and more properly, male or female. She, he, is my sister. Her essence is to be a mammal, a bearer by definition of mammary glands and a site for the operation of a transplanted human tumor producing gene, an oncogene, that reliably produces breast cancer. Above all, Onco Mouse TM is the first patented animal in the world in 1980. By definition, then, in the practices of material refiguration, she, he is an invention. So here is, here is my invention my invention, your invention, the invention that has been developed by science. This was one of the rats that I got. There were two different iterations of this project, and one of the, the first two rats were called Echo and Flowers. So this is Echo. You can see she's lost all her hair because she's, again, dealing with immune problems. Um, and uh, she was an amazing rat. Rats don't have a very good you know, reputation, right? Um, the bubonic plague, which was just disputed as to whether it came from rats. It's supposed to come from hamsters, so rats rule, finally, again. And then in New York City, and apparently this isn't done other places, I thought it was ubiquitous everywhere, but when union laborers, laborers have a, a protest on the streets, they always bring out this uh, giant inflatable rat. Like the managers of their company are rats, right? I thought that was everywhere. Apparently it's only happening in New York. They don't have a good... You know, people don't really like rats so much. But it's an interesting history because the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia in the beginning of the 1900s started to develop a standardization of rat breeding so that rats could be used almost in the same way that we would be selling chemicals. When you buy a certain chemical for, for a scientific experiment, you expect that it'll be same as your last batch, right? If it's not, the experiment's gonna go awry. People wanted the same thing from their rat models. Rats have been used in science since about 1850, and this woman, um, uh, Helen Dean King, actually was able to develop a series of albino rats that were so identical that they could be used in scientific experiments so that one model could be considered the same as the next. And those rats then went everywhere. By 1930, they were being sold as far as China and Japan. This is like a 1950s lab, and this is my installation. So. <laughs> Um, you can see this was about 20 feet long. This is about nine feet high. They had places to hide. These little huts here, everything could be closed off if any of them had to be quarantined. They had a vet that came and saw them. They had really good uh, food, different kinds of environments, literally like stones and stuff to play on and uh, places to climb. I tr also treated them with homeopathy, hoping that that would work. I did talk to the scientists who developed them, one of them. And the, my rats did live longer than their life expectations. Rats don't, rats don't live very long anyway. But they were sick. They were, they were not well. But they, had a, they got stronger and had a better life in the museum than they did in the lab, for sure. They were retired breeders, kind of like me. And um, the thing that was beautiful was the, the person who fell in love with them the most was the night watchman. I did not change their circadian rhythm. They play at night. They're nocturnal. So the night watchman became totally in love with them because he would go play with them every night. At the end of the exhibition, he came to me. I'd taken them home. So unlike Alba, I was able to get them out. And uh, they came home with me. And, he, and Peg, Mike and Peg, his wife, came to me and said, can we take the rats home with us? And so one of them had died after about a month or six weeks. And they, they got the other two that they stayed with them till they died. And they were really happy. Here are pictures of the rats that were, we had a very intimate kind of relationship. The thing that I should point out is that rats and mice and birds are technically not considered animals under the Farm Act, the, which is under the Animal Welfare Act in this country. And so not, they get less, in a way, technically, they get less protection than things like dogs, cats, primates. This doesn't mean they don't get veterinarian care. They get really good care in the laboratories. People couldn't, scientists couldn't get away with the kind of treatment uh, that poor treatment of the animals. But what it does do is it considers them products then. It does liken them to these chemicals that we could, that could sell. So this framing them as manufactured goods for research is something that I think we need to look at. We don't really know how many lab animals like rats are made in this country every year. And I'm talking about literally made. There's probably 80 million rats and, and mice sold in the US alone in one year. But we don't really know. I was lucky enough to go on a residency to Symbiotica 
which is in Western Australia, the farthest place on the earth, Perth, Australia. And it's um, a, a residency that invites scientists and artists to the human anatomy, um, biology and human anatomy department at the University of Western Australia. And you get to work in a kind of wet lab situation. The project I was interested in working on was called the Vampire Study Group, which is an umbrella for a few different projects. But this was the, you know, research-based speculative fictions dealing with themes of life, death, and bio biotechnology, and then some hands-on things. To me, this was the most demanding frontier, is this idea of manipulating life and living tissue, dealing with the materiality of that. Um, and this figure of the vampire was really interesting to me because it's kind of a liminal you know, existence, has a kind of queer body, and it's suspended between life and death, right? Now, Haraway, in that quote that I read you before, this is the continuation of the quote. Crafted through the ordinary practices that make metaphor into material fact, Onko Mouse's status as an invention, who which remains a living animal, is what makes her a vampire, subsisting in the realms of the undead. So I really wanted to look at the animal's existence in the lab and what that might mean. And when I say animals, I use this term very broadly. So here's one of the projects that I started there and I'm still working on called Rat Laughter. This project is about uh, ultrasonic vocalizations between rats. Rats have a certain register of sound that we can hear. And then they have a whole nother register of sound that goes beyond our hearing capacity. So it's in an ultrasonic uh, hearing range. And I started thinking about this and researching this idea of ultrasonic uh, sound between rats. And I borrowed somebody's bat detector, because bats, like rats, speak, can speak in this ultrasonic range. And a bat detector basically takes that audio frequency at an ultrasonic uh, level and downs, downsizes it so that you can, um, downsamples it so that you can listen to it within our register. So I was working in the laboratory with some rats and, the, and their, their attendees and um, hearing them talking to each other and I was sort of amazed and all of a sudden I heard this horrible sound. It sounded like firecrackers. And I like whisked around to the, because my back was to the attendants, I was looking at these rats. I turned around to them, I said, what did you just do? And they said, oh, we took a plastic wrapper off of a syringe that we're gonna give the rats a shot with. It was incredible how loud it was to me. That's how it sounded to the rats. So that made me understand a little bit more what their, what their audio environment was. And I really wanted to try and change that. So we did work on some things like take the plastic off the syringe outside that room, et cetera, et cetera. And these rats were being used for surgery and stuff like that. And so I thought that they could use a little laughter. Here's a scientist who I found who really totally rocked my world. Dr. Jake Panksepp, who now is, he's not at Bowling Green anymore, he's now at Washington State. But he realized that rats have a certain register in this ultrasonic range of kind of chirps, where they're kind of giggling, what he considered giggling. And this is at about the 50 to 55 kilohertz sound range. So he's a neuroscientist, and I wanna show you, a, I'm sorry, it's kind of degraded, the image, but it's an incredible in, uh, video that he has online that talks about this emotional state of rats and rats giggling. And um, which way do I go this way? Oh wait, I can do it up here, okay. As we have listened to animals playing, we have heard what appeared to be the sounds of laughter. And uh, we studied these for a couple of years without quite understanding that this might be laughter. And then one day we decided to tickle some animals. And we realized that we had to look at the sounds at a very different register than we can hear. So we uh, obtained these transducers that are called bat detectors that can bring very high frequencies down to our auditory range. And when we did this and we listened in, we could tickle animals and generate a lot of vocal activity that appeared to be laughter. 
these animals would begin to enjoy our company and they would start to play with our hands and wherever we would put our hands they would follow it. And when we tested these animals to ask whether they were enjoying this kind of activity, the unambiguous answer was yes. So, you know, rats are kind of a totem animal for modernity. They've been around for quite a long time with us, right? So I do feel a kind of sympathy for them, especially having had some now. But this project also I find really interesting because when I left the laboratory in, in Australia, for example, the attendants would turn on the radio for the rats. They'd turn on, like, country western music or something. And I thought, wow, do rats really like country western music? Hmm. Um, so I've decided to make a rat, con rat laughter concert for them. And what this project does is it collects giggles from many, many rats and puts it together in an ultrasonic range. And then we will play it back to the rats. I'm working with a composer and musician uh, who's amazing, Jesse Stiles. And we're still trying to figure out, of course, there's a huge learning curve I figured out. Like, oh, I don't know anything about ultrasonic recording. Great, but I'm learning. And um, we're working with rat fanciers, people who own rats have these clubs and they're insanely in love with their rats, which is fabulous, and they want to come tickle their rats for us. So we're going around with these ultrasonic micro microphones and recording tickled rats. And so, so yeah, it, and it really will be a project for them. I will downsample it so you guys can hear it too, but it will really mostly be for the rats. Still ongoing, probably within about a year we'll have it ready for you. Another project I developed at Symbiotica is called Blood Wars. And um, this is basically uh, dealing with immunology again. This is a topic you saw with the rats, the transgenic rats I had in uh, mass mocha. And then this deals with uh, the immune system specifically. It's a competition between two people's blood. Basically, what I do is I take blood from two different donors, and two different people who are you know, offering me their blood. People love to offer me blood, their blood. It's really amazing. So I'll take their blood. And it becomes kind of like a, uh, a World Cup series. Like, you know, these two people fight, and then there's a winner. And these two people, f their blood fights, and there's a winner. And then they have a, a face-off, right? And this can expand as much as you want. So it just depends on how much lab time you have, as many people as you want to volunteer, et cetera. Here are some volunteers I've worked with. Um, it's a process which I had learned in the laboratory while I was in, on residence at Symbiotica of separating out the white blood cells from the red blood cells in the plasma. <clears throat> um, and then uh, ultimately what happens is that you stain the two different people's white blood cells. One is stained a kind of green and one is a kind of red, orange. They're put back in a Petri dish together and then filmed under an incubated microscope for anywhere from eight to 10 hours as the blood cells kind of go at each other. That's the blood wars. So here's a picture of the cells. And I'm going to play you this sampling of the um, wars, some of the cell wars. And if you look at this, uh, what I would suggest is if you focus on kind of like a particular area, kind of like you might in a football match, right? Like it's a big field, and that's kind of confusing. But if you look at one little area, you can sometimes see different cells engaging. And this was amazing to me was that Sometimes, a lot of times people won, and winning means that there's more of a field of one color versus another. But sometimes they didn't. Sometimes the cells actually made love. Sometimes the cells actually mutually committed suicide, like Romeo and Juliet. So there are these amazing results. And again, this project is ongoing. We're hoping to do it interspecies, like mouse and man, you know, kind of blood wars. We're hoping to do um, synthetic blood, you know, blood made through synthetic biology versus human blood, see what happens. So it's continuing, I hope. Okay, and if you guys can bear with me for just one final project, which will go through this. I think this is almost done. But you get the idea. And I find this to be really incredibly mesmerizing. Like, I could watch this day and for days, just days and days and days. And basically, it's a fluid exchange between the cells. Okay, 
my last project, which is going to be part of the installation that I'm, the exhibition that I'm doing, is called Fecal Matters, uh, which is about the gut microbiome. The, the exhibition Waste Matters, You Are My Future, is all about this. And this is a project which I'm just starting. So it's not very, uh, the, what you're seeing is kind of my beginnings of symbolic research around it for the exhibition. Um, I'm interested in how much bacteria we're made up of and how much we're made up of other organisms and what that means. And there's super huge amount of research going on in this area right now, which I find really interesting about the ecologies of our bodies. Looking at our bodies as different ec ecological fields as opposed to just uh, you know, our intestines and our immune system. It's an incredibly complicated scenario going on inside of us, and we are just beginning to learn about it. So it's like body, uh, you know, ecology. I'm also interested in this area called fecal transplantation. Um, t anybody heard about this? It's taking poop, oh yeah, you would have. Uh, it's taking poop from one person and putting it into another person. And it's a treatment, and it's being used and saving people's lives at this point in time. You remember the Miranda July movie, you know, me, you, and everyone we know, and this is thanks to my, my uh, student, Guy Schaefer. Um, it's a little six-year-old who's on a kind of porn website, and he types this up. You poop into my butthole, and I poop into your butthole, back and forth forever. And like the woman, well, maybe woman, we don't know, it's the internet, on the other end, like loved this line, you know, just went crazy. And here's the six-year-old with his 10-year-old brother going, oh, no, now what do we do? You know, she wants to meet up. And this was the symbol that was developed for it. Oh, I love this idea. So I've sort of developed my own version of it, which is a little nuts. You'll see. Um, I thought, like, wow, who would I want to exchange? You know, there are all these rules about it. But just speculatively, like, who would I want to exchange poop with? And of course, who do I come up with but, Bo you know, David Bowie? <laughs> so I have developed an idea that I'm going to send him these, you know, pictures where I emulate him and then beg him for his shit. <laughs> so here's me doing Bowie. And I have to thank my genius photographer friend, Eleanor Goldsmith, who also touched me up. So I look like I'm a lot younger than I am, which is very always great. And... Um, I should say that there are a lot of other parts to this project. Um, so I'm, you know, it's nascent and I'm trying to develop the ideas around it. But this is an idea that talks, starts to look at our internal biomes as a mirror to the imbalances we have, not just in our bodies, because of course I'm interested in the immune system in my own body, but also in larger eco, ec ecological sphere. Where, but also thinking about the gut as a kind of hackable Some space, as something that we could, you know, transform. So that's part of the interests I have between this, and I'm looking at it in terms of looking at soil remediation, looking at body remediation. So there are many levels of it, and we're collaborating with a lot of different people at this point in time. So come to the show. Patty Smith says the transformation of waste is perhaps the oldest preoccupation of man. So maybe that's what this project is all about. Thank you very much. So I know I went on a really long time, but if any of you have any questions, I would certainly entertain them. And we have a microphone, so you need to do the mic bit. Uh, just a simple question. I was wondering what all the color shifts were within the blood cell wars. Like yeah. Where all those colors are coming from and why some some of the videos or some of the plates were different than others? Yeah, we don't, you know, we don't really know all the answers because we didn't get to do as much testing with that as we could have and want to. There were two the two colored stains that stained the different cells. So one was green and one was red. And so what you're seeing is the leakage of the, st of the stained materials into the, into the body of the cell uh, uh, petri dish. So that's why some of them are more green and some of them are more red. The, for the most part, if everything became green, that the green, that that body of cells won, and they were when they were exchanging their fluids with the other cells, they would exchange their color into it too, and it would become a kind of green color. Is that sort of what you're talking about? Sorry. <laughs> um, yes. And I and I think about this project actually as a, as another 
project of um, being could be used for mediation, for example. Instead of people going to war, they could do this kind of blood wars project, mm -hmm. right? So, just yeah, you know, I wanted to say that too. But anyway, yeah. doesn't have anything to do with your question. Uh, as far as like the aesthetics of it, how how much of that is a uh, allure to you? I mean, like the ex aesthetics of that was really beautiful to me, um, or the the mouse, for example, also, which is. The, the hairless mouse, there's like a very strong aesthetic to these things you're choosing. Well, thank you. The, they're also really creepy. I mean, yeah. you know, like uh, the rats are really creepy to people and hairless rats gets even worse, you know. Um, and blood cells fighting uh, is kind of, there is something that happens when you're watching those cells, uh, which I think is interesting. There's a kind of identification with them. There's a kind of uh, anthropomorphizing of the cells themselves as we begin to think about them having this battle. The cells are just doing their thing, mm -hmm. you know. I think that much like pe people like tissue culture and art, uh, Yonetsu or, or in cats, I'm very interested in things that make us a little uneasy, things that provoke and that could be found to be beautiful, totally, but could also be found to be a little bit revolting or, or um, you know, make us uncomfortable. Thanks. Thanks. Anybody else? Stumped. I guess I just overwhelmed you. <laughs> Thank you for this talk. It's really interesting. And um, I was wondering, the project about the GMO super seeds launching yeah. in Europe, does that have significance like it would have here because it's happening in Europe where a lot of GMO has been prohibited? Yeah, um, I think that was, it has a different kind of context than it would read, how it would read here. And it's an older piece. Uh, I can't remember how old it is, but uh, if we go out of this, you get to see my, my lovely pussy cat. Um, if we go back to that slide. Oh, I'm not going to be able to find it, but anyway, let me see if I, well, now I can't even get it. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Um, yeah, I think that that does have a different kind of significance than it does here. And he was really interested in trying to see what happened with the, um, this is like a replay of the whole thing, right? Um, what would happen if certain kinds of uh, laws weren't put into place? Um, for this project. Actually, this project, I don't have a date on it, which is my bad, I'm sorry. Um, this project is about uh, at least 10 years old, maybe a little bit older. Um, so he was interested in trying to figure out a, a, a way of having people have the ability to do DIY kind of pranks or you know, tactical media pranks uh, against these giants like Monsanto and trying to subvert their takeovers because of the legalization of, I mean, illegalization of GMOs. And so it was on the verge of that beginning, to, that dialogue happening when this project was developed. So yeah, it's a, that's a really good question because I don't think it would happen in the same way here. E either people didn't have an understanding of GMOs here at that point in time, like we do now, um, or people just don't really care. You know, it's not as essential to, to food production. We're, we're sort of, we sort of have accepted it here, I think. In some ways, I mean, I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying I think that's what's happened. Thanks. Anybody else? And I saw your hand over there. Thank you. Um, I just had a. I was wondering how the U.S. compares to the rest of the world when it comes to research with genetic modification. If the U.S. has tighter regulations or like looser here or there's more money pumped into it? I'm just curious how it stands. Um, well, that's a really good question. I don't know that I know the answer. I think that there's probably um, less, I would guess, less regulations because the, of the ability of the companies here to lobby Congress to be able to allow for certain kinds of funding to go into research, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, Monsanto has a huge stranglehold on um, a anything having to do with GMOs in this country, and there have been a lot of farmers who have been trying to fight them and have lost huge amounts of money. You know, I mean, if they find GMO plants, their GMO plants in your fields, 
you're screwed. And that can happen through a bird taking a poop in your you know field, and that's just totally natural. Or the wind carrying a seed, and so. But Monsanto can go after you if that happens, and that has happened to different farmers uh, in the Canada and the U.S. So it's. Um, that's just the sort of bad legal side. In terms of the research, uh, I, don't, I don't really know um, about that much about what research is going on, um, but they're, they're, I'm sure that it's heavily, heavily funded, is my guess. So I, I'll look into it. It's a really good question. There was a question over there. Um, so you posed like a lot of ethical questions like concerning this type of work and I was just wondering if you had like any personal ethical concerns like about this research and experimentation. Um, yeah, good question. Yeah, I think that as, as I'm making this work, I'm always thinking about the ethics of it actually, and I'm always thinking about the ethics of um, what I'm doing and the context of, the, of the, the science around it. So for example, yeah, I'm really interested in bringing the visibility to the transgenic rats who are kind of invisible workers, right? Um, at the same time, ethically, I have a little bit of problems with my own production. For example, using these rats in a museum context changes them from science products to art products. There's a little bit of an ethical dile dilemma or conundrum there, which I'm not completely sad happy with. You know, I'm not completely convinced that I needed to, I couldn't have done the project without the sponsorship and the commission of the museum, but um, what would, you know, what does it do to have these rats exposed to 10,000 people a month for 10 months? You know, um, so yeah, I set up a good space for them, whatever, but you know, so yeah, there's, there's ethics, I think, on every front about this. And I think that we're constantly, when you're dealing with manipulating life, when you're dealing with, dealing with life, you're constantly questioning like, um, what that means and what should you do. You know, you have a, I mean, we're all, we're all in this together. We have cockroaches in our house. Do we really want cockroaches in our house? You know, or are we gonna figure out a way to live with cohabit with these cockroaches? The laboratory stuff, you know, I think that the artists are actually often preceding some of the scientists in terms of questions they ask and, and ethical questions they're beginning to ask. Like, for example, Tissue Culture and Art did a project growing uh, in vitro meat long before it became sort of the thing to do. Like, let's grow meat in the lab. And, you know, they found that it's a totally ridiculous idea because it's gonna cost way too much money to grow our steaks in a laboratory, and they're not gonna taste great. So ultimately, you know, I think artists are in a really good position to work collaboratively with scientists and begin to ask these kinds of ethical questions that open up some of these kind of questions that are there, but need to be d discussed much more deeply and much more at length than they are at this point. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you guys. That was awesome. You're great.